Welcome back for another Share Facidium video. This is a version of a talk that I got to give to a group of chief medical officers from children's hospitals around the country. They asked me to talk about the pediatric subspecialty shortage and the pipeline, uh, the training pipeline of, of subspecialty pediatricians. And um, so that's what I did. And in this talk, I hope as, as I wind through those topics that we have the opportunity to apply a little bit of logic and maybe a little bit of skepticism and some economic principles to all the data and rhetoric that surround this looming pediatric subspecialty shortage. Uh, because only then can you develop practical solutions and identify opportunities for advocacy for these pediatric hospital leaders. And to do this, we've got to proceed through several layers of analysis from the most common and also the most superficial to being a little bit deeper and more realistic. But let's start here with chapter one, the face of the pediatric specialty shortage. This is Lachlan Rutledge. He's six years old and he lives in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. He has asthma, severe enough that it's landed him in the PICU multiple times. And back in October of 2022, he was the subject of a New York Times article that addressed the challenges that some families face when they access pediatric subspecialty care. The article profiles Lachlan and explains how, in order to see a pediatric allergist, his family had to make a 14-hour drive from their home in eastern Oklahoma to Denver, Colorado. Lachlan wasn't the only patient profiled in the New York Times story. The reporter also met a boy named James who lived in Texas and had to commute four hours each way to go to his dialysis center. And there was a two-year-old boy in Montana who routinely makes an 11-hour trip to get IVIG infusions. The New York Times story, you know, like so many other popular media coverage of this issue, it does one thing really well, and that's put a face on what's a real human problem. Lachlan could be a child in many of our communities, and the strain that families endure just to take care of their kid, it tugs at your heartstrings. It leaves you ready to fight for change, and it ought to. But like a lot of media coverage, it's light on data, and it doesn't suggest much in the way of potential solutions. If you want to figure out how to help Lachlan, and all the children like him, we gotta dig a level deeper. So let's move on to chapter two, where we'll do just that. Let's try to quantify the pediatric subspecialty shortage. That New York Times article that I mentioned, it highlighted one dimension of the pediatric subspecialty shortage, which is geographic. These are some data from the American Board of Pediatrics. And what they did here was look at where children live and what the driving distance would be to see a pediatric subspecialist. So as you can see from this pie chart, 43% of children actually live within 10 miles of a pediatric subspecialist. But if you take the green and yellow wedges here, there's another 32% of children that live between 11 and 40 miles from a pediatric subspecialist. And if you look at the orange and the red, we've got a quarter of children in this country who live more than 40 miles away, and around half of those live more than 80 miles or more. Now that pie graph is just a weighted average of all pediatric specialties. So here's how that distance works out if we break it down by subspecialty. As you can see, for the average family to have access to a neonatologist or critical care physician or a cardiologist or a hematologist oncologist, the mean distance is less than 20 miles. But for some specialties, the mean distance is over twice that. The average child lives 42.8 miles from the nearest pediatric rheumatologist and 65.2 miles from the nearest transplant hepatologist. Now here's an even more informative graphic, which again comes from the ABP data. I think this one better captures real local access to care for families because now, instead of just linear distance, they examined hospital referral regions. Now those are geographic areas that are defined by the Dartmouth Atlas Project as a, being a regional market for tertiary medical care. To, to be a hospital referral region, you gotta have one hospital at least that does major cardiac surgery or neurosurgery for adults. Overall, there's 306 of these hospital referral regions around the country, and almost all of them have a NICU and um, at least two thirds or so have a PICU and a cardiologist and a gastroenterologist. But less than half of these hospital referral regions have a pediatric nephrologist or an adolescent medicine specialist or a specialist in child abuse or sports medicine or palliative care or sleep medicine. And again, pediatric rheumatology seems to be the specialty within pediatrics where access is most strained, which is 36% of hospital referral regions having a pediatric rheumatologist. And of course, geography isn't the only face of the pediatric subspecialty shortage. Just because you have a specialist doesn't mean that you can get an appointment with them. So here's some data about what appointment wait times look like. They come from the California Children's Specialty Care Coalition, which includes 18 different children's organizations in that state. Now the blue boxes represent median wait times. And as you can see, for some specialties, it's pretty low. Uh, 
You can see a cardiologist or an otolaryngologist within three weeks and wait times for general surgery, hemonc, and infectious disease are even shorter, less than a week. But then there's a handful of specialties where you're looking at a six to nine week wait time, like endocrinology, gastroenterology, nephrology, neurology, ophthalmology, pulmonology, and rheumatology. And then there's a few specialties where wait times are more like three or four months. And in that group, we've got allergy, developmental and behavioral pediatrics, and genetics. And there's maybe another side of the pediatric specialist shortage that we ought to consider. And that's a side that I think was familiar to many of the people in the audience for this talk. And that was the hospital side. It's difficult to find subspecialists to fill vacancies in some specialties. These are some data from 2017 when the Children's Hospital Association surveyed its members and said, what pediatric specialist vacancies have you had at your hospital for over a year? And this is the list of specialties that were named in descending order of frequency. At the top, child and adolescent psychiatry and developmental pediatrics were cited by 47% of respondents. But even those that, that appear at the bottom of the list were still frequently cited by multiple children's hospitals as being vacant for more than a year. And in that same CHA survey, they also asked, what are the shortages that most impact your ability to deliver care? And these were the results. 9.7% of hospitals said neurology, 10.8% said child and adolescent psychiatry, and 11.8% said developmental and behavioral pediatrics. So let's pause and regroup before we enter into chapter three. At this point, we've learned a few things about this pediatric subspecialty shortage. We've seen that it's not uniform. Access to care for some specialties, whether that's measured geographically or in terms of average wait time, is actually pretty good. But access to others is more challenging. And the issues that we've seen, you know, at this point, it's not clear whether they're due to inadequate supply or increasing demand. So now it's time to dig another level deeper and take a look at the pediatric subspecialty pipeline. So let's start here with the results of last year's NRMP pediatric specialties match. The bars here show the actual number of fellows who matched into various pediatric subspecialties. So it gives you a sense of the magnitude of the pipeline that's feeding each of those subspecialties. Now, obviously, neonatology is the most populous pediatric subspecialty. They brought in 268 new fellows. But in contrast, many pediatric specialties are small. Actually, there are more entering fellows in neonatology than there were in pulmonology, infectious disease, nephrology, developmental behavioral, adolescent medicine, rheumatology, and child abuse combined. And now, let's take a look at how these numbers are changing over time. Again, these are more data from the ABP. And for at least five subspecialties, there's really been steady growth in the number of first-year fellows over the past 15 years. Those five specialties are critical care medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, GI, neonatology, and cardiology. And then there's another group of five specialties where growth is less robust. But I think still you could look at some of these curves and make an optimistic case. Pediatric hospital medicine has only been a specialty for a few years. I think we're going to see that curve march upward steadily in the years to come. And then you got pulmonology and hemonc and rheumatology and child abuse, where the curves are awfully flat, but actually if you fit a regression line, it still ends up having a positive slope. But then there's a group of specialties where the overall growth over the past 15 years really is flat. The overall slope of these regression lines is zero or very close to it. And these are specialties like adolescent medicine, developmental pe behavioral pediatrics, infectious disease, pediatric nephrology, and endocrinology. And these, of course, were some of the same specialties that popped up most frequently in Chapter 2. So right here, a logical person might wonder whether the growth in these specialties is being constrained by the availability of fellowship positions. I mean, if the number of fellowship positions is inadequate, then certainly we're going to see these flat curves through the pipeline, right? Well, let me assure you, that's not the case. Here are more NRMP data showing the proportion of unfilled positions in each specialty in last year's match. In fact, this chart looks like the inverse of the AVP's growth charts. The specialties that have had the most growth over the past 15 years, neonatology, critical care, cardiology, emergency medicine, gastroenterology, they had the fewest positions available after the match was over. In contrast, some of the specialties with flat growth, like infectious disease and nephrology, they have half or more of their available positions still open when the match is done. And with all we've learned so far as foundation, now it's time to move on to chapter four. And this is the part of the talk where we transition from descriptive analysis to policy analysis.
Up to this point, we've seen that many of the specialties that have the most challenges with access, fields like pediatric rheumatology or developmental behavioral pediatrics or adolescent medicine, they also have the weakest pipelines. So that suggests uh, a rather obvious solution, which is let's build up the pipeline. Maybe let's just turn this little knob up here and increase the flow rate through the training pipeline. And then instead of just a little trickle of, of pediatric subspecialists, we'll have a steady flow that will fix the pediatric subspecialty shortage. So for the rest of this talk, let's analyze that solution as well as some others. But first I need to come clean about something. This whole talk I've assumed a certain context when I've talked about this pediatric subspecialty shortage. But it's time to come clean and be honest about what a physician shortage really is. And it turns out that's a hard thing to define. Labor economists themselves don't even agree on how to measure a labor shortage, which makes it kind of hard for us to define whether and to what extent one even exists. Here's a quote from a journal article. No single empirical measure of occupational labor shortages exist, nor does it appear that one can easily be developed. So constructing solutions really depends on what face of the pediatric specialty shortage you see. And when you consider all those things carefully, it may not be clear that increasing the pipeline is the optimal solution or even a solution at all. So actually, chapter four is just a tease. If we're gonna identify real, practical, actionable solutions and targets for advocacy, we gotta go down one more level with our analysis. We can't be superficial. We gotta consider first, what problem exactly are we trying to solve? And second, why does that problem even exist in the first place? Because when you answer those things, you find the levers that we might be able to pull to make an impact. So in chapter five, we're gonna look back at some of the data that we've already looked at, but this time with a more critical analytic eye. Let's start here with the slide that I showed you before. It's that list of all the subspecialties that were cited in the CHA survey several years ago as having jobs that, that were open that didn't fill in 12 months. It's a big list, right? But when I look at it, the first thing I gotta wonder is, have you tried increasing your offer? And usually the answer is no. Sometimes in medicine, when we say there's a shortage, what we really mean is that there's a shortage of something at the price we want to pay for it. But that's not the way that economists would look at it. I mean, for instance, I, I might like to drive a Tesla Model X, but I am unwilling to pay the $90,000 sticker price. Does that mean that there's a shortage of Teslas? Not really. I mean, I could have a Tesla today, just not for the price that I would prefer to pay for it. So from the outset, I think we all need to recognize that this is how market economies are supposed to work. We get to an equilibrium between supply and demand, not by political advocacy for more supply or less demand, but by allowing that equilibrium to be determined by price. And look, from the beginning, I've got to be fair and acknowledge that there's things about the medical economy that make it trickier for market forces to work like they do for soybeans or crude oil. But I think it's also fair to acknowledge from the outset that a certain amount of the debate and discussion about the pediatric subspecialty shortages is because we want the medical economy to work differently. But there's more to see when we re-examine these data because when you first look at this list, I think you're struck by how many specialties are included. I mean, at least that's what struck me. But if you look at it closely, you may notice what's not here. Neonatology is not on that list. Critical care medicine is not on that list. There's no cardiology or GI either. In other words, there doesn't seem to be much trouble filling vacancies in specialties where there's more growth in the fellowship pipeline. So let's mine this out a little bit. If the problem that we're trying to fix is that, that certain positions are vacant, uh, maybe this is a pipeline problem. Let's take a closer look. Let's think about what makes pediatric residents choose their fellowship. And here's some data from the AMP from a survey of graduating residents in 2019. Now others have done similar surveys and the results are always nearly identical to this. So as you can see at the top of the scale are future job opportunities, interest in specific disease or organ systems, exposure during residency and mentors during residency. And as far as policy targets, some of the things on this list make sense. Um, I mean, to me, exposure during residency makes good sense. You can't be it if you don't see it, or at least you probably don't wanna be it if you can't see it. But not all pediatric trainees train at programs where they have all the subspecialties available. Some of the fields that we looked at before are actually pretty small. So if this is a lever that you wanna move, 
then the target for your advocacy ought to be the ACGME. Here I'm showing you the current ACGME pediatric program requirements. As you can see, the ACGME guidelines prescribe a certain number of subspecialty faculty. You got to have at least one adolescent medicine physician, one developmental behavioral physician, one neonatologist, one critical care physician, and one pediatric emergency physician. Beyond that, you got to have at least five other subspecialties, but you get to choose which ones they are. But back in February of this year, the ACGME re released a draft proposal that eliminate all this. Under the new proposal, the only type of specialty faculty that would be required would be faculty with expertise in mental health. Now there was pushback, and back in May, the ACGME, ACGME announced that they wouldn't change the new requirements uh, just yet. They wouldn't go into effect until at least July of 2025, and they were going to conduct a more comprehensive and detailed review of the proposed revisions. If you see the proposed changes as being good, it's probably because you work at a hospital that doesn't have the full complement of subspecialists. But you'd like to have a residency program anyway, and you view these requirements as being an unnecessary hoarding of GME by hospitals that have a NICU and a PICU. But if you're opposed to these changes, well, you might have lots of things that you could say, and many of them are self-obvious and don't need to be articulated by me in this forum. But I would add that decreasing the subspecialty pipeline is a minor consideration and is probably another cause for concern, because I do think that exposure and positive role models are necessary prerequisites to choosing a specialty. But let's go back to those survey data, because there's more to see here. Uh, what, else, what else might we be able to move to influence specialty choice? What's at the top of the list? Well, you know, interest in specific disease and organ systems is pretty high up there. But uh, is that surprising? I mean, shouldn't that be table stakes for choosing a particular specialty? So again, what's more interesting to me is what's missing. 12% of people say that that isn't really that important to them. Oh, oh, you're a cardiologist. You must love the heart, right? Ah, uh, nah, not really. What's motivating that other 12%? Same thing for mentors. You know, if you go to a pediatric nephrology meeting this day, there will always be a, a hand-wringing session on the future of pediatric nephrology's workforce, and someone will always bring up data like these and say, look how important mentorship is. See, we need better mentorship. That's how we're going to get more people into pediatric nephrology. And everybody usually nods their heads better mentorship. That's what we need. But let's think about that a little bit more. Because if you accept that as true, then I think you also have to accept as true that the quality of mentorship in neonatology or cardiology is just systematically better than in nephrology or infectious disease. And I think you'd also have to accept that the quality of mentorship in fields like critical care is just increasing exponentially, um, while the quality of mentorship among pulmonologists is stagnant. Because otherwise, how else are we going to explain those trends that we saw just a few slides ago? So again, to me, what's more interesting is this 26% of people who are choosing their specialty, not because of their mentors during residency, but seemingly in spite of them. What's motivating them? Here again is a slide that you've seen before on the proportion of hospital referral regions that have a pediatric subspecialist. On the one end, we have neonatology, cardiology, and critical care. On the other end, rheumatology. Now I'm going to show you these same data, just a little bit differently. Now I'm going to show you these data as a scatter plot. So on the x-axis, we have those same data on the percentage of hospital regions that have a pediatric subspecialist. But now on the y-axis, I'm showing you physician compensation. Now. What do you think is driving the specialty choice? Funny thing is, every now and again, when I say this, some people get upset. They say, I'm a cardiologist because I love cardiology. I love the heart. I wouldn't have done adolescent medicine if you paid me three times as much. And um, for many individuals, I believe that's completely true. But in the aggregate, I think it is a simple and universal truth that human beings respond to economic incentives. Pediatric trainees are no different. And to be sure, it's not just that some specialties provide greater economic incentives, it's that certain specialties actually provide disincentives versus the very real and achievable alternative of not doing a fellowship and practicing as a general pediatrician. Here's a paper that was in pediatrics a couple years ago, and the authors calculated the net present value of a career in different specialties. 
Under the assumptions they're modeling, only three specialties had a consistently greater lifetime NPV than doing general pediatrics. Those are cardiology, critical care, and gastroenterology. The axis here can be a little bit hard to read, but it shows thousands of dollars. So a resident who chooses to do a three-year ID or endocrinology or adolescent medicine fellowship is foregoing around $1.5 million in wealth by the time of their retirement compared to working as a general pediatrician. I think it's beyond reasonable debate that changing the salaries of various subspecialists would change the distribution of trainees that wanted to enter those subspecialties. I think that much is obvious, but what's much less obvious is how that could ever be achieved. Because physician salaries are determined by what payers are willing to pay for the CPT codes that they generate, which in turn is ultimately based on this very simple equation that you see here. And obviously, these values aren't set by anything that resembles the supply and demand economics that govern the price of wheat or an iPhone. When Medicare transitioned to a physician payment system based on the relative value scale back in 1992, they allowed that RVU scales could change over time, but the important thing is that the process has to be budget neutral. Pediatricians of all types, actually, are, are relatively under-reimbursed compared to their adult counterparts, whether you're talking about an office visit with a general internist versus a pediatrician, or an endoscopy from an adult GI or pediatric GI doctor. But we're also living in a world in which healthcare expenses as a proportion of GDP are rising rapidly. And I just don't think we're in a political environment in which overall physician reimbursement is going to increase doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to highlight these issues to our lawmakers, but I think that we got to acknowledge that this is a big lift and is something that's ultimately beyond the control of the audience for this talk. Still, there are potentially ways to increase compensation that might be within the reach of the audience of this talk. This is a paper that just came out in the Journal of Pediatrics, and it was authored by a group of the pediatric departmental chairpersons. It was called Raising the Bar the need for increased financial support to sustain and expand the community of pediatric subspecialists. They highlight this problem and they note that many academic pediatric subspecialists earn less than an academic general pediatrician or hospitalist. So they float the idea of using departmental funds to increase the salaries of specialists who make less than that figure. This is table two from their article and it shows how the math might work out. So if you wanted to bump one assistant, one associate, and one full professor in a subspecialty division up to the 50th percentile according to the AAAP benchmarks, you could, and it would only cost you $44,568 per year. But as you can see, this gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. There are nine specialties who earn, on average, less than the AAMC's 50th percentile for a pediatric hospitalist. So if you wanted to bring in one assistant, one associate, and one full professor in each division up to that mark, you're going to need over $400,000. And look, folks, that money's got to come from somewhere. And it's not clear whose salary is going to have to be cut or what other trade-offs would have to occur because of what needs to be done to generate that amount of extra income. So is there anything else we could do to change the incentives and make doing a fellowship more worthwhile? Well, maybe, because if you look closely at the data that I showed you a moment ago about the lifetime financial consequences of fellowship training, part of that difference is because of the time that's spent in fellowship. A person who spends three years in fellowship not only gets three fewer years of attending salary, but they also get three fewer years of compound interest on their retirement accounts, three fewer years of home equity, and so on. So what if we shortened the duration of fellowship? Actually, most fellows are in favor of this. Here's a quote from a survey of pediatric fellows a few years ago. Despite the perceptions by some fellows that certain aspects of their residency were not relevant to their current training, only 30% said that they would have shortened their residency if given the option. More striking was the finding that 52%, more than half of the respondents, would have selected a two-year fellowship without research training if it were offered. So why is it then that we have these three-year fellowships for most specialties in pediatrics? The short answer is that the ABP requires it. But why do they require it? I mean, if I had wanted to be an adult nephrologist, I could have chosen between two-year clinical fellowships and three-year academic fellowships, and either would have been accepted by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Why is the ABP different? And if you trace this back, the answer is very interesting. This goes back to the early 1980s when some physicians in hematology oncology petitioned the ABP to increase their fellowship length to three years. There's too much new stuff to learn, they said, and of course, you can't just know clinical stuff to be a specialist. 
you have to have time to do research and contribute to the body of knowledge in your field. So they said, what we think we want is to have a two-year general pediatrics residency and a three-year fellowship. And this led to a lively debate among other subspecialties about what the optimal training model for pediatricians and pediatric subspecialties should be. And so in 1985, the ABP convened a meeting to hear from stakeholders and decide what to do. And at that meeting, this is the model of care that they envisioned. This is how they imagined that care for children would look in the future with a division of labor between general pediatricians and subspecialists. Here's a quote from the article outlining what occurred at the conference and the ABP's policy for the future. The general pediatrician should be considered a specialist and as such should be expected to provide 90% of health care for young people. Of this, 60% would be in basic comprehensive care and 40% in more complex subspecialty services. The specialist, the, the general pediatrician meaning, should be able to care for 80% of the so-called subspecialty problems and to do so more efficiently, more appropriately for the family and less expensively than the subspecialist. In contrast, subspecialists should provide only eight to 10% of total care and their principal activity should be in the advancement of biomedical science. Currently, only 10 to 20% of subspecialty residents completing training are capable of becoming competent, competitive scientists. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, but I think it's safe to say that nearly 40 years on, we simply do not live in a world in which the general pediatrician cares for 90% of pediatric problems and 80% of subspecialty problems. And yet we're still using a training model that presumes that this will be the case. And we're spending most of our training time in fellowship to develop researchers. And maybe if the proportion of, of fellows completing training uh, that are capable of becoming competent competitive scientists has increased, maybe that's nice, but we still don't have the funding from a greater percentage of this, nor do I believe that, that fellows have any greater desire to, to become competitive scientists in the current era than they did previously. So perhaps if you want to strengthen the pediatric subspecialty pipeline, First, we got to convince the ABP to reconsider what the optimal training model is for the way that pediatric care is actually delivered now and is likely to be delivered in the future. But let's move on and examine some other things. Are there other things we can do other than increasing salaries or reducing the negative NPV to induce more people to choose these specialties that are flat? Is there anything we can do to improve the pipeline? Well, maybe there is. Maybe we also need to make sure that the people who start fellowship finish it. This is a graph that I made showing attrition from the first to final year of training for various pediatric subspecialties using the ACGME data. I included pediatric residents here to serve as a frame of comparison. You can see the attrition from general pediatric programs is around 3.9%. but That's much less than almost any pediatric subspecialties. And some of the specialties that are at the top of this list with attrition over 10% are some of the very specialties where the pipeline is the weakest, like nephrology, developmental behavioral pediatrics, and adolescent medicine. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, it's not clear to me that this isn't just another manifestation of the financial issues that we've discussed before, but I think it deserves a little bit more explanation. It doesn't make sense to build up the pipeline if you're not also patching the leaks. Along those same lines, if your goal is to ensure that you have enough subspecialists to care for the kids, you ought to consider whether there are leaks in your existing supply. Pediatric subspecialists work at academic medical centers. And in academic medicine, we have a system where success is often measured by how much clinical time has been bought out for other things. The people who take care of the kids, they exist at the bottom of the pyramid. The people writing grants and publishing papers and directing QI and administering various things, they exist on higher levels of the pyramid. And look, academic medical centers have missions that are related to research and QI and education and all these things. And subspecialists who have talent in those areas, they should bring their talents to bear on those missions. But we still have to be careful that we don't create a culture in which patient care becomes devalued that we're encouraging people to leave clinical care, even if that's where their talent and their heart is, just to make it to another rung on the pyramid, just to get a bump in, a, in their salary or a new title. You don't have to recruit for as many subspecialists if your existing subspecialists are being rewarded for doing the work of taking care of the kids. Now let's shift gears away from hospitals and look back at the patient-facing sides of the pediatric subspecialty shortage. This is the distance you have to travel to see various pediatric subspecialists. So how are we gonna fix this? Well, 
if you think about the specialties over here and the specialties over here, uh, these are the larger specialties and these are the smaller specialties. So on first pass, it certainly appears that the more physicians there are, the more geographically accessible they tend to be. So with just this simplistic analysis, again, maybe we just need to increase the supply. If we simply trained more, say, pediatric rheumatologists, then they would naturally settle into a more favorable geographic distribution and these bars would flatten, right? This is a map of my state, Virginia. And on this map, I've noted with gold stars, the locations where pediatric rheumatologists work in Virginia. There are only three locations. They're in Northern Virginia, outside of Washington, DC. They're in Richmond, the state capital, and they're in Southeastern Virginia, near Norfolk, Virginia Beach, where I now live and work. Now, I grew up though, out in Southwestern Virginia. And uh, if I needed to see a pediatric rheumatologist, I would have had to drive four or five hours if I had to go to a center in Virginia. So let's say that we increase the number of pediatric rheumatologists. How much would it have to be increased for me to have had a pediatric rheumatologist out where I lived in southwestern Virginia? I mean, I'm not sure. That's a tough question to answer, but it begs a different question, which is why are pediatric rheumatologists only located in these three parts of Virginia? And that's a little easier question to answer. Virginia's population center, the geographic point at which a, an imaginary, flat, rigid map of the state would balance if all 8 million people weighed the same amount, it's located around here in Goochland County. If you ever stop by, there's a plaque off the roadside. Um, so it goes to show how few people there are relatively in all of Western Virginia compared to in this corridor here. There just aren't that many people out there, and there are even fewer children with rheumatologic disease. It's just not a good business proposition for a pediatric rheumatologist to practice there, and simply increasing the pipeline of pediatric rheumatologists doesn't change that fact. Now you could say, from a patient standpoint, who cares if they're busy or not? I mean, if we're focused on patient care, uh, maybe it's better if they got a little more time on their hands. Maybe we still should just train more and more pediatric rheumatologists until no one has a full clinic. And then eventually some of them will inevitably trickle down and work in some of the most remote geographic areas. But that kind of logic, um, it ignores the harm that comes from having too many doctors because doctors have a way of making work for themselves. And it's probably not the best idea for patients or the American healthcare system to incentivize doing things that don't need to be done. If you really care about patients, there's another harm that you should consider too. I use pediatric rheumatology as the example here, but you probably noticed that there was one specialty to the right of that on the ABP graphic, and that was transplant hepatology. A pediatric patient who has, uh, has to see a transplant hepatologist has to travel farther than any other subspecialty, 65 miles. But we don't need a liver transplant center on every corner. Liver transplant is a very complex endeavor, and outcomes are better where case volume is higher. We see this time and time again in pediatrics, whether we're talking about neonatal ECMO or complex congenital cardiac surgery or organ transplantation or whatever. There's a trade-off where you have more centers and the trade-off is that outcomes aren't as good. What that means is in, in very stark terms, some of the children that could have been saved won't get saved. That same trade-off applies to the extreme lack of geographic access to physicians. So we have to balance those trade-offs in maintaining appropriate expertise with minimizing travel times. And it can be hard to get that right. If geographic access is the problem that we're trying to fix, it's not clear to me that that can be fixed by just increasing the pipeline. Instead, I think if you care about fixing those geographic disparities in access to care, then there are potentially other solutions that you ought to consider maybe more outreach clinics, more robust access to telemedicine, and so on. Let's look at another problem, which is the long wait times for families to even get an appointment. Here are those California data that I showed you before. And um, just like we've done before, before we hypothesize about solutions, we ought to try to understand why wait times look like this in the first place. And the first thing that should jump out is, like we talked about before, wait times for some specialties are pretty short. Um, and if you think about what things children might be referred for, that makes sense. If a child has cancer, they can't wait 72 days like they do to see the allergist. They need to be seen right then. And indeed, most of them are. And even the specialties that have low wait times, there's still a long tail to that distribution. And, you know, we can't be sure from the data that are available, but it stands to reason that children that are waiting six weeks to see the cardiologist are more likely to be healthy appearing kids with murmurs than kids having cyanotic spells. 
Now, wait times for developmental pediatricians and geneticists are still quite long, but if you see those data, you could actually use them to make the case that the system's working okay. And probably one reason that wait times are longer for genetics is because patients can wait longer to see the geneticist. But probably the more important reason is that clinics, regardless of specialty, they have multiple incentives to keep their clinic schedule full. It's more efficient to have a full schedule. I mean, you could choose to keep some clinic spots open for urgent referrals or sick visits, but you might end up with empty spots if those sick or urgent patients don't materialize. And if you have more sick or urgent patients that you got to work in than you plan for, well, your day is going to be chaotic anyway, so you might as well just book up the whole day and then do whatever's got to be done. When your overhead costs are fixed, that's certainly the preferable business strategy. And there's something else too. Let me tell you about something funny that I've gotten to see firsthand over the past year. You know, my group has been down a nephrologist for a little over a year. We used to have a pretty accessible clinic. Our, our wait time to third next available appointment was usually just a few days. But then the group shrunk and, um, you know, children continued just to have the same exact amount of kidney disease that they had previously. So our wait time started to get longer and longer and now is at about three months or so. But along with that, our same day reschedule rate and our no-show rate dropped. And if you think about it in economic terms, it's easy to understand why. If you can get another appointment with a specialist within a few days, then it's easy to be deterred from going to your previously scheduled appointment because you realize that day is going to be inconvenient. You just call and you get it moved to a different time that suits you better. The schedule's wide open. On the other hand, if the schedule's booked solid for months and months, even if the day that your appointment falls on is more hectic than you had planned, you're going to get your kid to the appointment because you're a good parent and you don't want to wait three months for them to get the care that they need. These incentives matter, and they have to be considered if you want to solve this problem. Because if you just train more subspecialists, but they all have the same incentives to keep their clinic schedules full, you may find that you have more specialists seeing kids more frequently and keeping their schedules just as tight as they do now. And I touched on this briefly before, but let me hit it again very explicitly. Doctors make work for themselves. We have very little, if any, high quality data on how often patients need to be seen. Should you see a child with type 1 diabetes or moderate persistent asthma every six months, every three months, every month, every two weeks? How often a patient gets seen is a function both of patient factors and of system capacity. And pediatricians and children would probably benefit from fewer productivity metrics and better data about what optimal follow-up really looks like. One more thing before I move on from wait times and geographic access. This is a table from an article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. It's a list of pediatric subspecialties and a bread and butter condition that they might treat and a script that was used for an experiment when people called various subspecialty clinics and tried to make an appointment for their child. Only thing is, the child wasn't real. All the clinics got to hear the same standardized script with just one difference. Sometimes the child had private insurance and sometimes they had Medicaid. And here's what happened. Across all specialties, 89% of the patients with Blue Cross Blue Shield got appointments. 34% of the patients with Medicaid got one. Now this study's from 2011, so maybe things have changed. And this study was done in the Chicago area, which is, of course, a market with an unusual degree of choice between a number of pediatric health systems. So maybe there's an incentive here to play chicken with the other systems by declining appointments and seeing if you can push off the Medicaid patients onto your competitor. But to whatever extent these results are generalizable, and to whatever extent they contribute to disparities in access for families, well, it should be obvious that just increasing the number of, of pediatric subspecialists isn't going to fix it. Now, there's one other thing that you ought to know when you're thinking about pediatric specialty shortages, and that's this. These are data from the Census Bureau. And as we all know, the population of the U.S. is getting larger. But notice that the reason it's getting larger is because of growth in the population that's 25 years old and older. The pediatric population, though, is actually completely flat. In contrast, this is what the pipeline for the overall pediatric workforce looks like. The number of pediatric residency positions that's offered in the match grows each year, and it's up nearly 40% from the early 2000s, again during a time when the overall pediatric population is flat. So we ought to leverage this to think about how best to take care of the kids. 
Maybe the solution to the pediatric subspecialty shortage isn't more subspecialists. Maybe it's more capable generalists. Maybe the ABP was actually onto something back in 1985. Unfortunately, that's not the way that things are trending. Um, in fact, those proposed changes to the ACGME program requirements that I mentioned before, they actually place an increased emphasis on referrals. Instead of a pediatric residency training program being required to train their residents to, quote, make informed diagnostic and therapeutic decisions that result in optimal clinical judgment, end quote, they would now be required as a condition of accreditation to ensure that their program refers patients who require consultation. I think we ought to think seriously about what we're trying to accomplish here. And if we're being honest about broadly and comprehensively considering solutions to the pediatric subspecialist shortage, there's another obvious one that we need to consider, even if it's politically charged, and that's how much pediatric subspecialty care can be appropriately provided by nurse practitioners and physician assistants. If we can't train more capable general pediatricians or provide them with the right incentives to care for some problems that they currently refer, well, we could have those common problems managed by NPs and PAs. This chart shows the growth in nurse practitioners up to 2017. The curve continues to go up from there. And the thing you gotta remember is that there's a very long tail effect. Just like training a new physician, if you train a new nurse practitioner or physician assistant, there's no way to untrain them because you decide you don't need them anymore. They, they may practice for 30 or 40 years. What I want you to realize is that unlike anything else in this talk, where it would take significant effort to change existing incentive systems or drive change, this change is already occurring. It requires us to do nothing and is clearly the path of least resistance for addressing almost any aspect of any physician shortage. Before I close, it's time to come back full circle back to the title of this talk. I call this talk Touching the Elephant, and if you didn't already figure out why, it's time to review the parable of the blind man and the elephant. The parable itself dates to at least 500 BC, and maybe before, but one of the most popular versions was the poem by John Godfrey Sachs in 1872. It starts like this. It was six men of Indistan to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. And it goes on to describe how each of the men touches a different part of the elephant and concludes, based on their own experience, what the whole of the elephant must be. One man touches a leg and he thinks the elephant must be like a tree trunk. Another touches a tail and says it's like a thick rope. Another grasps a tusk and thinks the elephant's like a spear. This, this parable, you know, it appears in a number of cultures and it has such a broad appeal, I think, for the same reason that I chose to use it today. It makes a vivid point about the subjectivity of truth, and logical reasoning. And I think those points are directly applicable to the pediatric subspecialty shortage. What the pediatric subspecialty shortage looks like and what we ought to do about it, it depends on what part of the elephant you're touching. Do we need more fellowship trained specialists, more capable generalists, more non-physician providers, better incentives to alleviate geographic disparities, two-year fellowships, three-year fellowships, more pay for one kind of doctor or another? It all depends on your viewing angle. And this is the final thing I'm going to say, because we hear an awful lot about doctor shortages, not just for pediatricians. And most of what you hear comes from someone who has skin in the game. For instance, the most cited data source on the existence of a physician shortage is from work done by the Association of American Medical Colleges, which is, of course, a trade organization that represents the interests of medical schools, which are businesses gainfully involved in producing more doctors. Is it surprising then that when they examine the problems in American healthcare, that they conclude that what we need is more of what they produce? I mean, would you be surprised if we commissioned the National Automobile Manufacturers Association to do a study of transportation issues and they studied it and ultimately they concluded that we had a shortage of automobiles? I mean, look, look at all these sad folks sitting around at bus stops. Look at this guy, you know, who missed his flight. You know, all these people, they need more cars. You know, many of the data that I showed you here, uh, they came from the American Board of Pediatrics. And the data, they're, they're good data, but certainly the ABP is gonna benefit if a greater number of pediatricians pay for subspecialty examinations in MOC. The loudest voices that you're gonna hear talking about physician shortages, they aren't analysts, they're advocates. 
if you're an unmatched medical student uh, or the dean of a medical school that would like to expand or a leader at a hospital that would like to get accredited for GME but hasn't yet or an insurance executive who would like to strike more favorable contracts with physician groups you may be very much in favor of increasing the pipeline of doctors because it solves a certain problem for you but will that make things better for patients I don't know Obviously, all of us have our own biases and interests to protect, myself included. But as we analyze these things and advocate for change, I think we ought to try to touch the whole elephant, which is our duty to provide care for patients and make sure that that's what we feel and that's what we're thinking about when we make our plans. That's all I got. Thanks for listening.